but what is it? If you had to say what the inner child work is concerning the inner child from your perspective as a therapist, what would it be? Would you like me to elaborate or give quite a, a shortened definition or understanding of it? I, I would like you to be authentic and do you. <laughs> because that's why that's why I wanted to talk to you because you're authentic. So do you. Whatever you like to do, I go with the flow. So for me, um, definitely the reason why I also spoke to you about um, having that as one of our topics is because it comes in so frequently with in my interactions with my clients. And I think it's something that's quite overlooked. Um, and my understanding of it is that when we are experiencing childhood and, and, and going through those periods of our lives, a lot of what we a lot of our behaviors that are formed are aimed at we have to build a relationship with our parents and we have to do that for survival because as a child, you're dependent on your caregiver. Um, mm -hmm. And you learn so many different coping strategies and ways to manage by just trying to build that relationship because without that caregiver, you're going to be isolated, you're not going to have food, you're not going to be safe. And sometimes those, or up frequently, those coping strategies continue throughout our lives. So we, let's say, for example, when we were younger, we were taught that when mom comes home, we never know what mood mom is going to be in. So we need to keep a lookout, look at mom's facial expressions, behaviors, everything to see, okay, mom is not in a good mood. I need to adapt accordingly. I need to quickly go to my room or be quiet or whatever it is. And as an adult, those same behaviors frequently, um, we're still exhibiting those same behaviors. And I see it often with my clients where they still, for example, in that example, have the need to adapt themselves to the people around them without them understanding why. And wow. often that's because it links to the, the fact that when they were young, they had to adapt and change in order to survive in their environment. And they're still doing that. Even though they're actually in, in a different environment, they're no longer in, in having to sort of fight for survival from their parents, but they're still adopting those same coping strategies, which then become problematic within their adult lives. So I, and, and that's just an example, but the inner child work allows you to look at what is this kid going through? This little kid inside of us, how is he or she having to adapt and survive within the, within his or her life? Or how does how do they think they have to? That no longer is actually applicable, um, but but it's still causing oftentimes destruction in the lives. Because now you can imagine that person that had to adapt according to the, what mood their mum is in. Mm -hmm. They are going to monitor every social interaction they're in, and they're going to adapt according to who they think people need them to be which doesn't lead to authentic interactions. It doesn't lead to them being true to their emotions and expressing what they're struggling with, which obviously causes a lot of mental health conditions and a lot of um, disruptions um, in their lives. So I try and help my clients to see those links between what we're going through now and how that's sometimes linked to childhood so that they can actually break those patterns and have more self-awareness in it as well. And then without going off too quickly, there's also the element of almost the inner critic. Um, the other day I was speaking to a client and he was saying that, um, oh, I hate this part of me. I hate that I have to adapt um, to the people around me. And I said, I understand that this is bringing up frustration for you, but I also want you to, well, I want to encourage you to actually say to that little kid inside, I'm sorry that you had to do that. I'm sorry that you felt like you had to change who you are to adapt to the world around you. It's okay now. You don't have to do that anymore. You're safe now. You're in a different environment. And, and by doing that, by speaking that way to our inner child, it's actually breaking and reparenting ourselves and breaking some of these patterns that we did pick up from childhood. Um, yeah, so that obviously takes a lot of shapes within the work with my clients, but 
it's basically a long answer for you. No, 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 it was, no, it's not a long, this is exactly why I wanted to do this with you. Oftentimes with people that are very traumatized or even everyday people, they, they were taught that you need to silence yourself. You need to silence that mm-hmm. voice in order to be what other people want you to be. And the consequences of that is that as soon as conflict arises, that is extremely threatening to every survival mechanism, mechanism you've put in place. So in a work context, when you are required to put down boundaries or express your point of view or bring a proposal up or whatever it is, that can be, that can challenge every way that you've learned to survive. Where, and I've had that with clients where they don't want to speak up. They doubt themselves. They, they're petrified within a work context, but actually they have the skills and they're in that position for a reason, but they're constantly doubting themselves and also wanting to look to other people for approval. For other people's recognition of, do you think this is the best? Where well, actually, they if they went forward, they would know that that is there's a reason why that they are coming to that conclusion. But they want that recognition from others because it feels safer. So within a work environment, it can actually induce a lot of anxiety for clients like that, for people that believe that. I need to be, I need to make sure, I need to check in with someone else. I need to make sure that this is okay for the people around me. It can bring up a lot of anxiety. Well, often, um, not always, but often, there are so many family dynamics that have encouraged that behavior because obviously the family was the first example of relationships, of interaction, of if I say I don't like this, how is my mum going yeah. to respond to me? How is my dad going to react? Yeah. Am I going to be shouted at? Or am is is my difference of opinion going to be accepted? So obviously, often oh, that's the core where a lot of these dysfunctional patterns have started oh, to right. emerge. So mm-hmm. and and can often like we have the saying where we say systems don't like change. And when I'm saying okay. systems, like the family system oftentimes doesn't like change. They don't like someone all of a sudden. And that's sometimes what happens with therapy is they a client comes and they work through these things and they find their voice. Now they go back in the family system and the family doesn't like this. The family is being yes, challenged. Right, 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 yes, right, right. The, the structure the structure has been challenged. It, it, whether exactly. whether it be the prior, parental dynamics or the older siblings, whatever it may be, has been challenged. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. You were saying, I, okay, I get what yeah. you're saying. Go ahead. The family basically doesn't like that. They don't like that right. being challenged. Right. And, and that's why often in the work that I do, when a client is ready, I will encourage them to, to look at family therapy because when we do family therapy, we can gently start challenging or changing that structure as well that of that system so that it's not just the individual that's changing but it's also the system that they're going back into um so that it we can make it more sort of cohesive um but it is it, it can be really challenging because you can imagine if you're doing all of this work with someone and they're finding their voice and they're having an opinion and they're comfortable with saying i don't agree with that i don't like this and now they're going back into a family that that just that doesn't want them to have their own and, opinion, and it and it puts them back to square one, as it were, in that same type of behavior, dysfunctional behavior that that silences their voice. To for one, creating a safe space, if possible, <laughs> um, separate from mm-hmm. that family okay. dynamic. Right? Whether that means having a close friend that you can speak to and sort of. Like, okay. you know, talk about these dynamics with, but having a safe space where you can actually explore what you've been experiencing and feeling. Um, okay. and then starting to have awareness about these interactions, about these, um, these routines and these, these patterns within the family, because then, um, and I see it often in my clients, they start to, to identify it. For example, well, um, okay. The other day I had one of my clients interacting with her father and the father became um, angry and he said things to her and she immediately stepped back and she thought to herself, but that's... There you go, there you go. 
And, and when she realized that he's projecting, he's putting a lot of his emotions and his maybe insecurities or yeah. whatever it is onto her. And because she then has that, um, that perspective and she can identify and see these patterns from happening that she can identify, right. then she, she has that perspective and she can step away and say, you know what, that's actually your things coming in here. It's not mine, which she then yeah, went yeah. previously. She would be stuck in that cycle. She would be furious or she would be whatever. She would apologize, not realizing that th- this is actually not her baggage to carry. So that right. perspective really helps because then you can start changing it. So, so when, let's say I, let's say mm-hmm. I'm in a situation and I start to find myself dancing around others, trying to make sure that they're okay with me. That's exhibiting yeah. that type of behavior you're talking about. Then mm-hmm. is that is yeah. that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. So then, what what would I have to do? I would have to do what you said your client did. I would pretty much have to recognize that what's really happening is happening outside of me. And what what I'm doing is I'm reacting to something uh, because of the way I was conditioned in the past. Is kind of what you're saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. So what would you? Uh, So go ahead. Well, and then by having that perspective, you you move away from it, and it's sort of tricky to say where do we go from there because it it uh, it depends a lot on the family dynamics. Because I mean, for some families are open enough and self-aware enough that you can go to them and say, maybe at a different time, maybe when things are calmer, say, mom, I don't like it when you actually speak to me in that way or whatever it is. But for other families, you can't say that because you're going to be ostracized and rejected. And obviously, yeah, um, to a different family. Uh, even, even, even attacked for some, I'm, I'm yeah. just saying from what I hear, for some people, they even get a, attacked for or yeah. for even broaching the subject, even even going down that road, yeah. and so therefore they avoid going down that road altogether. Mm. Well, then that then that means that 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 person will go back to me. Make it about me. Let's make this about. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so 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 then if that's the case, then I, if I'm not going to go down that road because I don't want to receive the retribution and the and, and the tribulation from, from from opening my mouth and yeah. and 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 going against the grain. Then is it possible then that in, let's, we're talking about me, then I would carry that into my relationships as well. That same type of, of backing, backing up, keeping my voice silent, docile behavior. I would start to lose my voice even in romantic relationships. And if, if, if we were talking, mm-hmm. is that possible also? Yeah. So one thing I just want to add to this as well is that people, um, sometimes even start using substances or um, sleeping too much, working too much, whatever it is. Eating too much, pornography, pornography, all these other things, drinking too much, overeating, uh, going into a shell, as it were, to cope with the, the, well, they're doing that for what reason? I'll let you, why would they be doing those things? It, it's it's a, it's a way to comfort. It's a way to self soothe. For example, someone that um, comfort eats, they're doing that because of the actual comfort and self soothing that they get from the food. It makes them feel contained when the world around them feels chaotic. Um, and but and and what you were saying about entering into relationships. That's why it's so incredibly important for us to do the work with with people and and for people to actually get help for these things is because if if these things are unresolved and unacknowledged and if you're going through your life without the awareness of what's going on how these things are impacting you then these patterns keep repeating and I see that so often with clients where let's say they've been in three abusive relationships and they keep saying but how does this keep happening? Right, um, right, right, right. Oh, and, and it's it's sometimes because of their unresolved emotions that they are not deliberately they want to get as far away from it as they can. 
happen, that they end up choosing people that make them feel the way that they feel they deserve to feel. So if, if I right. feel like I right. deserve anything right. better, I'm going to keep choosing a partner that's going to treat me badly because, well, that's all I deserve. Right. So we right. need we need to have this awareness and this yeah, because with the awareness, then we can stop these cycles from repeating and we can actually change it and we can take the power back. Where if we so, don't have that awareness, these patterns just continue. With, with the awareness, uh, if that's the case, uh, so uh, a person because, no, let's go back. I, I'll be the, uh, I'll be the therapist, guinea pig. So with the awareness, then I must put myself in a position where um, not only am I aware, but I now, even if I fully don't understand the family dynamics, but I know it enough to know that, okay, I need to change the pattern in which I'm living my life emotionally. And I need to create an emotional safe place for myself. I need to have somebody, I like what you said much earlier, really makes sense uh, to have someone that I can bounce these things off of and get some perspective. Um, but let's say, let's say a person is maybe not overeating. Maybe they're going the other way. Maybe they're over exercising. <laughs> they're they're super into fitness to cope. Maybe they're mm-hmm. super into nature. They're finding all these ways to to cope. Yeah, is it always going to be something that's bad if they are not coping? Yes, right. If they um, don't cope in the long run, is it bad? I'm asking. It's there's going statement. to be consequences. There's going to okay. be an effect. I'm not saying that it's always going to be these um, overly dramatic consequences, but it can be, I mean, if you are, let's say now you're a father, you have, you chose a, a wife, whatever, um, and you're in a relatively happy relationship, but these issues are unresolved, as soon as your child says something that challenges maybe um, the way that you were raised, you're going to, that's going to immediately bring you to the defensive and you're going to either attack or you're going to shut the kid down um, because you are uncontained. I often say this to my parents if you are uncontained then you struggle so much when that kid says something that challenges your authority you overcompensate and you react to a much greater extent than is needed because of your own inability to you're not contained so you freak out and you attack um so even in those ways it's going to have an effect on on some of your relationships and on yourself um, because yes. you're moving away from what's authentic and true and where your pain really is and what you're really going through. And whenever we move away from what's authentic for us, that comes with a cost. Mm-hmm. So, yes, there will always be a consequence yeah. to it. Yeah. Okay. And even if you into, I'm in a career and I'm maybe yes. chosen yes. a partner yes. because I knew yes. that the partner which fulfill my father's expectations of who I marry or I know that my mother wanted to go into this career so she encouraged me to go and stop here I may be good at it but I'm not feeling fulfilled um one thing I also want to add about the inner child is that sometimes it's also about creating a space um where I, I, I spoke to some of my clients about this the other day, um, their parents, and I, and I spoke about creating a space for your child with rules, with expectations that are clearly communicated, but that okay. child's emotions are still being held. And what I mean by that yeah. is when that kid comes home and that kid had had a bad day, sometimes the parents – they almost start freaking out within themselves yeah, because yeah, I don't know what right. does this kid now need to change schools? Is someone with my child? And right, they right, right. feel uncontained. So they're not actually containing the space for that child. Where I teach a lot of um, my clients that are parents, hold that space for your child. Say, what does that feel like? What is the effect yeah, yeah, yeah. of this bad day on your body? 
And I also tend to not use labels like bad or good, but what does this right, feel right, like? Right, 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 right. And, no, and right. how do you feel you need to move? Like, what, what, do you, what would you like me? How would you like me to support you in this? And oftentimes that kid then sits with their emotion because they're actually given, given a platform and a space to just be. And that's yeah. also allowing the child to be authentic and allowing them to just verbalize what they're feeling yeah. because, you know, the parent will be there to contain it for them. And then pretty soon the kid has worked through those emotions and they're over it and they move on to yes. the next. Yes. The parent yeah. is maybe still, is my child yeah. going to be okay? But that kid has moved on. The parents, the parents. But, yeah. So what I also um, tell my, my clients is that, like for example for that kid to allow them to to express what they're feeling and and but that doesn't come to the expense of having certain expectations or rules in place so i tell them oh, that okay. the kid is allowed to express what they're feeling they're allowed to say mom i don't like that you just spoke to me like that or mm-hmm. dad um, you make me scared when you shout like that whatever they're allowed to say what they're feeling mm-hmm. but they're never allowed to disrespect or you know, go against the parents oh own value so for example if the parent says my darling you have to set the table every night and now the child comes Mm -hmm. home and they're angry they don't want to set the table it can be oh i understand you're angry it must be very frustrating unfortunately you do still have to set the table but i'm sorry you're not feeling well i'm sorry you're angry about that not okay fine then you don't have to set the table that's still an expectation placed on you it's still a rule and you're still required to fulfill that but Mm -hmm. the emotions are not devalued they're not they're still being validated yeah and uh i'll be right back in just a moment thanks perfect